Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you again for another Shabbat of being able to come together as your people Israel. Natural branches and grafted in, but one Messiah Yeshua. Father, we just ask that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit today as we study your Torah, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that you would enlighten us to the hope of your calling, Father. Teach us your ways. We want to know you. We just give you the praise, honor, and glory. Hashem Yeshua, Mashiach in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right. Did everybody read the Torah portion this week? Awesome. The uh, Hebrew, it's called Devarim, and it is actually the Hebrew name of the book of Deuteronomy as well. The first portion is called Devarim, and then the book of Deuteronomy is actually called Devarim also. And we're going to start reading from chapter 1, verse 1. And Devarim means words in Hebrew. So it, it comes, the Torah portion comes from the first phrase, basically. These are the words which Moshe spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hezroth, and Dishab. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month that Moshe spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Yahweh had given him as commandments to them. After he had killed Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt in Ashtaroth in Edre. On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moshe began to explain this law, or this Torah, saying, Yahweh our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn you and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland, in the south and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Now that's up there quite a ways, so there's a lot of territory we were supposed to take. See, I've set the land before you, Go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Avraham, to Isaac, and Yaakov, to give to them and their descendants after them. Skipping to verse 19. So we departed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites as Yahweh our God had commanded us. Now that's the thing we need to look at and notice. When we obey Yahweh, when He commands us things, we are blessed. When we disobey, we're not. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, You have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which Yahweh our God is giving us. Look, Yahweh your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as Yahweh God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, Let us send men before us, and let them search out the land for us, to bring back word to us the way by which we should go up, and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan pleased me well, and so I took twelve of your men, one man from each tribe. And they departed, and went up into the mountains, and came to the valley of Eshkol, and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us, saying, It is a good land which Yahweh our God is giving us. Now they should have stopped there, but they went on. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandments of Yahweh your God. So that's when you get bad things. When you rebel against Yahweh, it does not bring good fruit. And these things are done for our examples, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10. So we need to take note that we learn from our forefathers' mistakes. And you complained in your tents and said, Because Yahweh hates us, he brought us up out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anahim here. Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. Yahweh your God who goes before you, He will fight for you. And that is the key. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, says Yahweh. He is the one that fights for us. We just saw Him defeat the greatest army on the face of the earth, the Egyptians. And it wasn't because of our might. It was because of Yahweh. 
And it wasn't that long afterward that we came up and he wanted us to occupy the land, a couple years. According to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how Yahweh your God carried you, as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe Yahweh your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you, to pitch your tents, to show you the way which you should go, in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. And Yahweh heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it. And to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed Yahweh. This is not a part-time thing. This is completely giving ourselves to Yahweh. We are not our own. We're bought with a price. And we are to wholly follow Yahweh. That's where we're going to see His blessing. Yahweh was angry, also angry with me for your sake, saying, Even you shall not go in there. Yehoshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So of the twelve spies, ten of them didn't believe Yahweh. And every one of them saw the miracles of Egypt and the plagues and the deliverance, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night, manna every day, miraculous provision. And yet they thought because the guys were big that Yahweh couldn't deliver them. They believed what their eyes told them and used man's logic to make the decision. They hadn't renewed their minds. They got into fear contrary to their instructions. Yahweh had already given them the answer. And the result was they not only discouraged themselves, but they discouraged almost all of Israel. Only two of them looked past what their eyes told them. Yeah, the guys were big. There was no doubt about it. They were the size of Og. They were at least 13 feet tall. Those are some big guys. You don't want to try to fight them hand to hand. But that's not what Yahweh told them to do. They didn't have to fight the Egyptians hand to hand, did they? They remembered these two, Joshua and Caleb, remembered what Yahweh had done to the greatest army on earth, the Egyptians, for their sake. They had just seen it. It hadn't been that long ago. They remembered the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the daily miracles, like we said, of the manna, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. Now our portion reveals a principle for success. Every time we fight a battle, or a giant, and it's just like Joshua and Caleb understood. Deuteronomy 2, verse 1, it says, We then turned around and made for the desert in the direction of the Sea of Suf, as Yahweh had ordered me. We're following Yahweh's command. That's the thing. For many days we skirted Mount Seir. Yahweh then said to me, You have gone far enough around this mountain. Now turn north and give the people this order. You are about to pass through the territory of your kinsmen, the son of Esau, who lived in Seir. They are afraid of you and you will be well protected. Do not provoke them, for I shall give you none of their land. No, not so much as a foot length of it. I have given the height of the highlands of Seir to Esau as his domain. Pay them in money for what food you eat, and pay them in money for whatever water you drink. Yahweh your God has blessed you in all that you do. He has watched over your journeying through the vast desert. Yahweh your God has been with you these 40 years, and you have never been in want. So we passed beyond those relatives of ours, the children of Esau who lived in Seir, by the road through Arba, Elath, Ezion, Geber. Then changing directions, we took the road towards the plains of Moab. Yahweh then said to me, Do not attack Moab. Do not provoke him to fight, for I shall give you none of his land, since I have given Ar to the children of Lot as their domain. Skipping to verse 24. Uh, uh, on your way. Break camp and cross the Wadi Arnon. See, I'm putting Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, at your mercy, and his country too. Set about the conquest, engage him in battle. Today and henceforth I shall fill the people under all heavens with fear and terror of you. Whoever hears 
word of your approach will tremble and writhe and anguish because of you. Skipping to 31. Yahweh said to me, You see, I am starting to give you Sihon and his country. Begin the conquest by seizing his country. Sihon marched out against us, he and all his people to give battle at Jahaz. And Yahweh our God handed him over to us. We defeated him and his sons and all his people. We captured all his towns and laid all these towns under the curse of destruction. Men, women, and children, we left no survivors, except the livestock, which we took as our booty, and the spoils of the captured towns. From Arar to the edge of the Arnon Valley, as from the town down in the valley as far as Gilead, not one town was beyond our reach. Yahweh our God delivered them all to us. You did not, however, go near the country of the Ammonites, or the region of the river of Jabbok, or the towns in the highland, or anywhere forbidden us by Yahweh our God. We had great success. We defeated Og of Bashan, this massive giant. Everywhere we went, we had success because we followed Yahweh's instructions. Now, we didn't just pick arbitrary battles. He told us who to attack and who not to attack, and we obeyed him. And as a result, we always had the victory. If we will follow his lead, we won't fail. We've had attacks like this on our, our family time after time. My wife had a brain tumor at one point early on in our marriage. And Yahweh had just actually healed one of our children. He'd given us a whole list of scriptures to meditate on two months before we even knew there was a problem. We were sensitive to his leading, and so we started meditating on these scriptures. And when we found out about this problem with one of our kids, we immediately prayed, and we saw, and almost it wasn't instantly miraculous just totally, but the next time we went to the doctor, the problem was taken care of. And after seeing this, we prayed for Johanna, and he completely healed her. I mean, time after time, we've seen healings. But it wasn't just because we arbitrarily did something on our own. We listened to his lead, and he showed us what to do. He wants to lead us to victory in everything. Our job is to listen to his voice, to follow what he gives us. Because there's a different strategy. Every time we had to stand for healing, it was a different strategy he gave us. We did, it wasn't a formula. We couldn't just say it a hundred times and, and like we're taught in so many different places. We had to listen for his lead. But when we did, we had success every time. Because he wants to see us successful, but he wants us to follow his instruction. It says in 1 John 5, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know if he hears us, we know we have the petitions we desire. Our job is to figure out what is his will. It takes time getting on our faces before him, listening to his voice. But if we'll follow his instructions, we'll be victorious every time. Our complete obedience to Yahweh in what battles to fight and what battles not to fight is what gave us the victory. It's what enabled Yahweh to fight on our behalf. See, he wants to help us. And that's what obedience is all about. It, it's like plugging a plug into the wall. You're plugging into the provision, to the, to the healing force, to everything that Yahweh wants to do when we walk in obedience. Now, if we decide that we want to do things our own way, it's like plugging the plug out of the wall. You've disconnected from the power, and Yahweh wants to still bless you. He still wants to heal you. He wants to do all these things, but you've tied his hands. We've got a role to play in this. We have to be obedient. We have to always get our instruction from Yahweh on what battles to fight. I mean, there's things that look like there's something good in the natural, but we don't always know what's going on in the spirit realm and what Yahweh wants. That's why we've got to get his instructions. We see things in part. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Yahweh knows the whole thing. He sees the bigger picture. We only see pieces, so we don't have the, the information to be able to make proper decisions. Only Yahweh does, and that's why we've got to follow his lead. He's the only one that can give us the truth that will get us through every time. Now this truth we saw again when we went into war with Midian and didn't lose a single warrior in Numbers 31.1. We just read about this last week as a matter of fact. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. This was after Balak and Balaam and all of that. Afterward you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves for war, and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for Yahweh on Midian. A thousand from each tribe, from all the children tribes of Israel, you shall send to war. So there were recu recruited from our divisions of Israel, one thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. Then Moshe sent them to war, one thousand from each tribe, and he sent them to the war with 
Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, just as Yahweh commanded Moses. They followed the instructions again. And they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian and the rest of those who were killed, Avi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, the five kings of Midian. Bilam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Then the officers who were over thousands of the army and captains over thousands and captains over hundreds came near to Moses. And they said to Moses, your servants have taken account of the men of war who are under our command and not a man of us is missing. We didn't lose a single person in this battle. Therefore we have brought an offering for Yahweh. What every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets and bracelets and signet rings and earrings and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before Yahweh. So Moshe and Eleazar the priest received the gold from them, all the fashioned ornaments and all the gold and the offering that they had offered to Yahweh from the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds was 16,750 shekels. The men of war had taken spoil every man for himself. And Moshe and Eleazar the priest received the gold from the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it to the tabernacle of meeting as a memorial for the children of Israel before Yahweh. We can give and it can be a memorial. When we are obedient, we acknowledge Yahweh, he, He's protected us, He's delivered us. Proper response is to give. And that is a memorial where He wants to continue to bless us. We show our gratitude. He is faithful. Now our obedience also enabled us to defeat Og, the massive giant, Deuteronomy 3.11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. And that was, like I said, on the east side of the Jordan. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It is not in Rabbah, is it not among the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was its length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof after the cubit of a man. And this land which we possessed at that time from Orer, which is by the river Arnon, and half uh, Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, and all the regions of our God, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. Now Og made Goliath look dinky. He was at least 13 feet tall, possibly as tall as 18 feet. Goliath was only, what was it, five cubits in a span? Yeah, he was about nine feet tall. No giant can stand up before us when we're get, getting our instructions from Yahweh and we are obedient. If God be for us, it says, who can be against us? Nothing can. That is the power of submitting to Yahweh, to being obedient and to following his instructions. We will have success every time. Now, Og was the last giant on the east side of the Jordan from Bashan, the land of the giants. Now, the giants on the west side of the Jordan were more numerous, but probably not any bigger than Og. In Joshua 14, 6, it talks about this. Then the children of Judah came to Jehoshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which Yahweh said to Moshe, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed Yahweh my God. May that be all of our testimony as well. So Moshe swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed Yahweh my God. And now, behold, Yahweh has kept me alive, as he said these 45 years, ever since Yahweh spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moshe sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both going in and coming out. Now therefore give me this mountain of which Yahweh spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that Yahweh will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as Yahweh said. The Anakim were giants as well. And Yehoshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day. 
because he wholly followed Yahweh, God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kajeth Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. So Caleb never took his eyes off Yahweh and the fact that he would fight for him. He knew that it wasn't just his own strength, even though he had strength. He knew it was going to be Yahweh's anointing, though. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's my, my spirit, says Yahweh. Deuteronomy 3, 21, And I commanded Yehoshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your God has done to these two kings. So will Yahweh do to all the kingdoms throughout which you pass. You must not fear them, for Yahweh your God himself fights for you. Yehoshua had kept his eyes on Yahweh, and he knew that it was Yahweh who was fighting for them. Yahweh proved himself again when Israel took Jericho. Joshua 6.20, So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet that the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has had, she has as you swore to her. And the young man who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold, the vessels of the bronze and iron, they put in the treasury of the house of Yahweh. And Yehoshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she had the messengers, or hid the messengers whom Yehoshua sent to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before Yahweh who rises up and builds the city Jericho. He shall lay its foundations with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So Yahweh was with Joshua, with Yehoshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. Yehoshua trusted that Yahweh would always fight for him. He followed Yahweh's instructions. He didn't just make up things on his own. He listened to the leading of Yahweh. That was the key. And he completely, he wholeheartedly followed him, just like Caleb did. That's the key, holding nothing back. Joshua 23.9 For Yahweh has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand for Yahweh your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. If Yahweh is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Now, we know that these great spectacular things happened back in biblical times. We don't see a whole lot going on today as far as miracles like this. But it's coming again. 2,000 years ago, Peter stood up on the day of Shavuot at Pentecost and said, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of. You go back and you read Joel, though, and that happens right before the coming of the day of Yahweh. Well, there was a former and a latter rain that Joel talked about. That was the former rain before. The latter rain is coming, and that outpouring is going to be so powerful, we're going to see a harvest brought into the assembly that can't be numbered, that comes out from every nation, according to Revelation 7. And like Yeshua said, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works, because I go to my Father. When his spirit is poured out again, we're going to see things again, like what well, well, you read of in the book of Acts. Even more, though, because it's 3,000 people were saved on the first day. There were like 5,000 saved a couple days later. Those are big numbers. But we're talking about a multitude that can't be numbered when his Holy Spirit is poured out again. We've never seen anything like it. And these things are going to happen again if we're listening to his lead and if we're following his instructions, just like we did before. We'll see these things again. Now Joshua knew he was always able to trust Yahweh, and why is this possible? Well, he saw the things that Yahweh had done. But how do you keep yourself going when you can't see these miracles? You can't see things every day. There's a way, and this is what Yahweh told Joshua. Joshua 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, it came to pass that Yahweh spoke to Yehoshua, the son of Nun, Moshe's servant, saying, or assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moshe. 
from the wilderness of this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moshe, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the Torah shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Nor be dismayed, for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. It's that obedience, just like what we saw in the wilderness. When he speaks to us by his spirit, we obey. But we also obey to the written word, and that is just as powerful because he says, if you do everything written is, you'll be successful in everything you do. We're not trying to earn our salvation. We're saved by faith. But Yahweh wants to bless us, and the way to keep that plug plugged into the wall is to walk in the obedience, not only to his spirit, but to his word. And we will see the overcoming miracles every time we need one. He's faithful. Now Joshua heard from Yahweh and was there, it was where he told him to go. He, he was faithful to that. He was always obedient. He continued to meditate on Yahweh's Torah. And that's the key that he says, meditate on my Torah. This, it won't depart out of your mouth. Part of meditating is speaking it. Reading it, speaking it aloud, memorizing it, speaking it to yourself when you're walking in the way. Because it's powerful. Joshua's obedience kept the door open for Yahweh to continue to bless him. And Joshua wasn't the only one to fight giants. Look at 1 Samuel 17.4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Verse 26, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I don't care how big he is. He doesn't have a covenant with Yahweh. We do. God is for us. This guy can't stand before Yahweh. That he should defy the armies of the living God. Verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, to Shaul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Shaul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Shaul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. He's looking through his natural eyes, just like the ten spies. For you are a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant was, has killed both lion and bear with his bare hands. I think he can handle anything. Anything that Yahweh wants him to do. I caught it by its beard. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, Yahweh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Shaul said to David, Go, and Yahweh be with you. David knew Yahweh. He knew his faithfulness. He meditated in the Torah day and night. We know that from one of the Psalms that he wrote, the first Psalm, as a matter of fact. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. It's the key, meditating in it day and night, muttering it, speaking it, 
keeping it on your mind. It's Yahweh's thoughts. It's Yahweh's heart. And when we make it ours, we'll have success every time. Now David and Yehoshua knew what the Torah said. They continued to meditate in it. In Deuteronomy 28, we're told, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your God, and observe carefully all His commandments which I command you today, that Yahweh your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of Yahweh your God. When He leads by His Spirit and from what He's written in His Word, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. Yahweh will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yahweh will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all that you have set your hand and he will bless you in the land which Yahweh your God has given you. Yahweh will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he swore to you, if you keep the commandments of Yahweh your God and walk in his ways. His Torah is the key. Following the leading of his spirit is the key. And his spirit and his word will always agree. That's how we know we're hearing his voice. Then all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yahweh, and they shall be afraid of you. And Yahweh will grant you plenty of goods, and the fruit of your body, and the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground and in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers to give you. Yahweh will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give you rain in your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, you shall not borrow, and Yahweh will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath, if you heed the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. Obedience brings blessing. I know I talked about how that we've seen miracles in the healing of all our kids, but we tried for three years to have kids when we first got married. We just celebrated our 32nd anniversary, and we couldn't have kids. We got fertility testing done, and the doctors found problems with both me and my wife, and they said basically together there's not hardly any hope of you guys getting pregnant. And my wife goes, well, let's pray about it. And so we prayed, and she was pregnant like almost instantly. And every time she'd have a baby, she'd go back to the doctor and get checked out. He says, well, you don't have to worry about being pregnant again. There's really no way. Every one of our kids are a miracle. Every one of them. He's blessed us in the fruit of our body. That's part of his blessing, part of walking in obedience. We are the head. We're not the tail. When we walk in obedience, he's going to see that the blessings come on us and overtake us. The giants in our lives are not bigger than Yahweh and his Torah, the blessing that obedience brings. He is faithful and he wants to prove himself faithful. He's not a respecter of persons. We're not anybody special. We just decided we were going to obey a long time ago. And we followed what he led us into and we've seen blessing after blessing after blessing. We can overcome any giant or circumstance by meditating on his Torah and keeping our eyes on the Torah made flesh, listening to the Master as he leads us. In Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now notice it's every weight and the sin. It doesn't just have to be a sin. Sometimes things will bog us down that aren't sin, but we still need to lay them aside if they're holding us back. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. It's not always going to be fun. But the result was he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. In other words, it's not going to always be easy. We are going to suffer persecution, but just like Yeshua, he's going to bring us through every time. If we're walking, following his lead, and we're walking in obedience... You have not yet resisted the bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of Yahweh, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked of him. For whom Yahweh loves, 
he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Sometimes we're going to screw up and we're going to bring some chastisement. But he said, don't be discouraged. He's pruning us. He's bringing us through. He's maturing us, working out our faith. But if you are without chastening, in other words, if everything's always easy, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So if everything is hunky-dory, you might examine to see if, hey, am I doing everything all right? Because he didn't promise us a bed of roses. He did say the problems are going to come. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. That's the key. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. It hurts sometimes. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We're to learn by it. We're not to be like our forefathers and gripe and complain about it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We have to keep our eyes on Yeshua and His Torah. We have to keep our eyes on Him, especially when we're going through the trials and the tribulations. When we're facing giants, we have to keep our eyes on Him. Not get our eyes on the problem like the ten spies did. Now Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned that whatever state I am to be content, whether you're going through the fire like the three Hebrew children, or you're walking on top of the water like Yeshua, whatever state you're in, be content. I know how to be abased, how to suffer loss of everything. He's in prison when he's writing this for being persecuted for nothing that he did wrong, but for preaching the gospel. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. If we keep our eyes on Him, if we continue to meditate in His Torah and walk and follow His lead, nothing can hold us back. We will make it through everything. Paul understood this fact. 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because He who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. I don't care how big the giant is, the greater one lives inside of us. Nothing Satan can throw at us can stop us. If we're listening to the instructions of our master, he's going to bring us through everything. John understood this principle as well. Now, overcoming giants doesn't happen on its own. We had to swing a sword and defeat the giants when we entered the land. We still have to swing the sword of the Spirit today. Just like Yeshua, when he was attacked by the enemy, when he was tempted, he used the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We have to make a choice. Am I going to follow what my flesh wants to do in its lusts and pleasure-seeking, or am I going to follow the leading of the Master, which is going to guarantee me success? It's easier to follow the flesh, but it's much more rewarding to follow the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life and Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now notice, Christians will use this to try to say the Torah is the law of sin and death. But if you read the chapter 4 in Romans 7, he's saying the Torah is spiritual. The law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua is the Torah coupled with his spirit. Now it's the letter of the law if it's without his spirit. If you're trying to keep it in the flesh, it will bring death. But in the Spirit, it brings life. For the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua, the Torah coupled with the Spirit, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that was weak through the flesh, because if you're just trying to keep it in the flesh, you're not going to be able to, because if the law is spiritual, you've got to have a spirit. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, 
and on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, how did he do that? He, he did it so we don't have to, like Christianity teaches? No. He did it so that he could come and give us his spirit, like Ezekiel said in chapter 36, 26, and 27. He says, there's coming a time. I'm going to take out your stony heart. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments to do them. Why? So that he can bless us like he wants to. He wants to have that blessing in our lives. But we still have to be obedient. His Spirit's causing us to. We still have to choose to follow the Spirit, though, and not the lust of the flesh. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, it's fulfilled in us when we walk in obedience. That's when it's fulfilled in us, and we do it by His Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And the Torah is spiritual. Paul just told us that in the last chapter. Here we're going to read it here. What are the things of the Spirit? Romans 7, 14. For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. Now Paul's talking like a, a, a carnal person, one that's not been regenerated. A carnal person can't keep the Torah. The Torah brings condemnation to a carnal person because it, it points out the sin, and the sin brings the death, like he said. So the Torah is spiritual. Why would we be carnal sold under sin? Because we've either not been born of the Spirit yet, or we've not renewed our minds with His Torah. If we're still thinking the same old way, it's going to bring condemnation because we're not going to be walking in the Torah. We're not going to be walking in that obedience. And it's the disobedience which is called sin. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So what is spiritual mindedness? We're meditating in the Torah day and night. His Torah is spiritual, he just told us. So being spiritually minded means that we're minding the things of the Torah. Because the carnal mind, the mind without Torah, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the Torah of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now what does He do when He dwells in you? According to Jeremiah 31, He writes His Torah in our hearts. He causes us to walk in His statutes to keep His judgments to do them. You can't separate the Torah from the Spirit. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, he is not his. And if Messiah is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, or we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Remember when Yeshua says, Depart from me, I never knew you. The guys were casting out demons and prophesying in his name in Matthew 7. But they weren't being led by his Spirit, because his Spirit will lead us in the Torah. He says, Depart from me, I don't know you. You who are lawless, you who are without Torah, you have a, who hate my Torah, basically. The Torah is his standard, but as we're going to see, it's also his definition of love. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of, of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint equal heirs with Messiah. If indeed we suffer with him, there again, it's not going to be a bed of roses, that we may be glorified together. If we're walking in obedience, following his lead, we are going to be given the same reward as the Messiah himself. Equal heirs. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
for the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. No more aches and pains, but better yet, no more pull towards the things of the flesh. For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see, we eagerly await for its perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, all things, even in the midst of the fiery furnace, he's going to bring us out. That's the key. The tribulations aren't going to be fun, but they're going to all work together for our good. If we keep our eyes on him and keep following his lead, we're going to make it through everything. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. It's a done deal with God. That's what I'm saying. Let's look at one another the way that he sees us. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Messiah who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall tribulation? And the answer is obviously no. Or distress? Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Now we have to choose to walk after the Spirit and not after the lust of the flesh. And part of how we do that is by renewing our minds, just like he told Joshua. Meditating in his Torah day and night. We do it by being obedient to his Torah. And he points it out here in Deuteronomy 30, where he sets before us life and blessing. Verse 8, And you will again obey the voice of Yahweh, and do all his commandments which I command you today. Yahweh your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of Yahweh your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the Torah and if you turn to Yahweh your God with all your heart and all your soul. Just like Joshua and Caleb did. For this commandment which I command you today it's not too mysterious for you nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? And as Paul said in Romans 10, that is to bring Christ from above. He equates Torah to the Messiah. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, and then I command you today to love Yahweh your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply. He wants to bless us. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. 
I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love Yahweh your God, that you may obey his voice and you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And you may dwell in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov to give them. We again cling to him by obeying him, by following his lead, by seeking his face. He is our life. So we have to choose to make Yeshua our master. And we have to choose to obey his Torah. It's his teaching and instructions. He's the one that gave it to Moses at Mount Sinai. Acts chapter 7 talked about the angel that was with us in the wilderness that gave us the living oracles. Yeshua, as the angel of Yahweh, gave us the Torah. The commandments of Messiah go all the way back to Bereshit, to Genesis. Now, as we obey his Torah, his love is perfected in us. Look at 1 John 2. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Just like he told us in Deuteronomy 30. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in context, whoever keeps his commandments, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked, the example of walking in Yahweh's Torah. So God's love is perfected in us when we keep his commandments. Because all of his commandments hang on the two greatest. In Matthew 22, 36, there was one that came and said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the Torah? Yeshua said to him, You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The rest of it are the details on how to do the two greatest. How do we love Yahweh? We keep His commandments. He says to have a holy convocation on Shabbat, we come and we do that. He says to have a holy convocation at Sukkot, we, we do that. We follow His commandments, and that's how we are loving Yahweh, by His definition of how to love. Now, if you throw away Yahweh's Torah, you can no longer love by His definition, which is what happens to those guys in Matthew chapter 7. Even though they're casting out devils and prophesying in His name and doing mighty works, like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, Though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so I could remove mountains or cast out devils or do mighty works. He says, without love, I am nothing. And that's why Yeshua has to say, I depart from me, I never knew you. Ezekiel talks about how that a righteous man can walk all his days in righteousness, but at the end of his life, if he turns from his righteousness, his righteousness won't be remembered anymore. That's what Yeshua is talking about when he says, I'm going to have to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Your righteousness is not remembered. You might claim to be walking in love, but in reality, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you if you're not keeping his commandments. Yeshua said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we show him that we love him. So if we really love Yeshua, we will keep his commandments that are contained in his Torah. 1 John 5, 2, this is how we show the Father. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. So if you're claiming to have the love of God and you're not keeping His commandments, it's not true. Scripture says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. We prove His love, we walk in His love by keeping His commandments. Because all the commandments are all about love. By His definition... You can't throw out his definition and make up your own and call it love and it actually be love. It's like the golden calf. They called it Yahweh, but was it Yahweh? No. Yahweh didn't receive the glory from that alternate form of worship. So if you claim to love God, you will prove it by keeping his commandments contained in his Torah. His love is perfected in us through keeping his commandments contained in his Torah. And they are his definition of what true love is. Now, there's another result of keeping his commandments contained in his Torah. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfected in love. So his love is perfected in us when we walk in his commandments, and as his love is perfected, it casts out fear. That's how we can face giants and not be afraid, because we're meditating in his Torah.
Fear is driven out. This is how we can slay every giant. This is how we can choose to be encouragers of Israel and not discouragers like the ten spies. We can be like Joshua and Caleb and encourage those. This is how we choose life, like he said in Deuteronomy 30. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb. What an honor it is to learn your ways, to walk in your light, in the light of your Spirit that leads us into your Torah because of Yeshua, our Messiah, and His shed blood. We thank you, Father, for your Torah made flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, the living Torah. Continue to open our eyes to your Torah. Continue to enlighten our hearts to love and fear your name. Father, you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha V'hunecha Yisah Yahweh P'nav elecha V'yasim lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. We will go next door and bless him for the bread and wine and partake of a meal together. Hallelujah.